This presentation is called, What is Dual Inheritance Theory? And as we discussed earlier in the semester, what we call evolutionary anthropology is a bundle of competing approaches that are sometimes complementary and sometimes in conflict. We've already looked at evolutionary psychology which is abbreviated EP. And we also looked at human behavioral ecology. And we considered the differences and similarities between them earlier in the semester. Now we're going to look at a third approach that's called dual inheritance theory, which is abbreviated DIT. So we're going to answer three questions. First, what is dual inheritance theory? Secondly, how does dual inheritance theory differ from evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology? And thirdly, how does dual inheritance theory differ from social cultural anthropology and more broadly, the social science approach? As you'll recall, evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology developed in opposition to the social science approach. And we can define this in relation to three core social science themes. The first theme concerns the uniqueness of humans and specifically the argument that culture makes humans unique and it's something that no other organism has. The second theme is the argument that culture is about groups. It's a collective phenomenon and it overrides the interest of individuals. So in understanding culture, we can focus strictly on groups. And the third theme is that culture is extra genetic and not transmitted genetically. And what this means, if we start with the third theme, is that if you pose the question, should we pay attention to genes, the social science answer has been no, that genes have no significance in human behavior because of culture. And the second question would be, well, should we pay attention to individuals and individual psychology? And again, there the argument is that no, Culture is something bigger than individuals, and we don't need to pay attention to individual decision-making or interest. And then in terms of human uniqueness, the question might be, should we pay attention to primates and other mammals and look for continuities with humans and try to figure out how we indeed differ? And again, the social science answer has been no. We need focus only on human beings. And what this adds up to is, well, should we look at evolution? And again, the answer was no. Evolution isn't important to understanding contemporary human behavior. So as we said, in the social sciences, evolution stopped with culture. It hit a red light and the light turned green instead for cultural influences on behavior. And you might say, well, that's got to be putting matters too uh, boldly. The social sciences don't deny evolution. And that's true. Social scientists would agree that evolution explains all living organisms. Um, but then they'd say, except humans. And that's because humans have culture. And quite reasonably, you might say, well, maybe that's putting matters too baldly. Maybe it's more complex than that. And we could then make it a little finer and say that social sciences would agree that evolution matters for humans, but it only mattered until culture evolved. And once we get culture, once again, we can let go of evolution. So it's a fair statement to say that culture throughout the 20th century preempted discussion of the evolution of human behavior.
Now, as evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology developed, they more or less returned the favor. So now, instead of evolution hitting a red light, culture hits a red light, and evolution gets the green light. And in the perspectives we've been looking at so far, we've had very little to say about culture. And that's because for many evolutionary anthropologists, culture isn't viewed as a significant influence on human behavior. And instead, the effort has been to develop evolutionary explanations which don't rely on culture. So it's fair to say that in evolutionary anthropology for the last several decades, for the most part, evolution has preempted discussion of the role of culture in human behavior. And we seem to have this situation where we can't talk about both culture and evolution at the same time. So there's three core themes in evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology that invert those themes from the social sciences. And the first is that humans evolved, and we evolved according to the same principles as everything else alive, and we are not unique. The second is that evolution is mostly about the evolution of individuals, and that group selection is either a weak or non-existent evolutionary force. So we've moved from an emphasis on human uniqueness to a sense of humans being the same as other living things, and from an emphasis on groups to an emphasis on individuals. And the third theme then is that adaptations that significantly influence our behavior are genetic, and culture is at best a thin veneer with limited influence on what we do. So culture uh, went out the door and evolution has taken central stage. But over the last uh, few decades, change has been in the air and it's even reaching now into evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology. And as an example of that, in a recent essay, one of the leading thinkers in human behavioral ecology, Monique Borgerhoff Mulder, she wrote an essay with a title called Human Behavioral Ecology, Necessary but Not Sufficient for the Evolutionary Analysis of Human Behavior. And notice that she didn't just say it was necessary but not sufficient for the explanation of human behavior, but for the evolutionary analysis of human behavior. And why isn't it sufficient? She goes on to say that human behavioral ecology does not address the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is culture. So culture has been tackled by some evolutionary thinkers from the 1970s, but the recognition of its importance to an evolutionary understanding of humans is increasing uh, quite dramatically in recent years. So there is a third contender uh, besides evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology. There's what's called dual inheritance theory, and it's been around since the 1970s. And the heart of dual inheritance theory is the argument that we have two systems of inheritance. One's genetic and one's cultural. And by saying that one is cultural, we mean that it occurs outside of genes, but the insistence is that genes and culture co-evolve and influence one another. Among the key contributors to dual inheritance theory, I'm going to emphasize two thinkers, uh, Peter Richardson and Robert Boyd. And in looking at their work, uh, they've published an enormous amount, but we're going to look primarily at a book called Not by Genes Alone, How Culture Transformed Human Evolution. And if you're interested in this perspective, this is the most accessible book from this perspective. And by keeping all of my citations in it, it will be quite easy for you uh, to find them and read more. So some evolutionary anthropologists have argued that dual inheritance theory is simply the social science approach 
returned, it's Social Cultural Anthropology Reborn, and the definition of culture that's utilized in dual inheritance theory is familiar to anyone who's studied the social sciences. So Boyd and Richardson define culture as information affecting individuals' behavior that they acquire through teaching, imitation, and other forms of social transmission. So culture affects individuals' behavior and culture is something that's learned, and it has a collective quality to it. And this seems to be simply a return to the idea of culture as something extra genetic. But there is a difference between dual inheritance theory and traditional social cultural anthropology. And one key part of that is that in dual inheritance theory, culture evolves and it evolves in a manner somewhat similar to how genes evolve. So dual inheritance theory, again, is about how genes and culture interact, but it also applies evolutionary analysis to the evolution of culture itself. A second aspect of dual inheritance theory that leads some critics to argue that it's simply the social science approach returned is the significance of groups in this approach. And to quote again Boyd and Richardson, they argue that group selection on cultural variation has been an important force in human evolution. And so, as we've talked about, uh, neo-Darwinians kicked group selection out the door, and dual inheritance theorists insist that it does matter, as it turns out quite a number of evolutionary biologists now argue that group selection does matter. But there is a difference between dual inheritance theory and traditional cultural anthropology in relation to groups, and the most important aspect of this is that in dual inheritance theory, selection is viewed as acting on individuals within groups, as well as acting on groups based on cultural attributes. So there is no removal of individuals from the picture. Instead, in dual inheritance theory, there's an interaction between selection at the group level and selection at the individual level. And this complexity has to be added to the fact that this is acting both on culture and at a genetic level. Now our third theme in the social sciences was the argument that humans are unique. And here we find again that dual inheritance theorists do stress that humans are distinctive and that culture has a good deal to do with that. So to quote Boyd and Richardson again, they hold that only humans show much evidence of cumulative cultural evolution. But once again, there's a difference between dual inheritance theory and traditional sociocultural anthropology. And that is that they argue that much extragenetic transmission, much of what we can call culture, is common in other mammals as well as primates and indeed vertebrates. So now we're looking at the interaction between derived and conserved aspects of culture. And the argument of dual inheritance theorist is that many aspects of culture show up in other primates and other species and that there's only a few derived characteristics of culture that are special and important in humans. So again, there's not a radical separation of humans from other living things. So let's summarize the contrasts that we've drawn. First, we've contrasted social cultural anthropology to dual inheritance theory. And we noted that social cultural anthropologists following the standard social science model insisted that culture makes humans unique, that evolution stopped once culture evolved, and that culture is about groups. It's a group thing. In contrast, dual inheritance theorists 
hold that humans evolved with a cultural twist. They argue that evolution has continued and that culture and genes continue to co-evolve rather than evolution stopping once culture begins. And lastly, rather than accepting culture as simply a group thing, they insist that selection acts on groups as well as individuals. So those are the differences between social cultural anthropology and dual inheritance theory. Let's summarize now the differences between dual inheritance theory and evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology. So here we argue that the three core themes in these approaches are that humans evolved just like other organisms, that selection in humans builds primarily genetic adaptations, and that selection builds those adaptations by acting on genes and individuals. Dual inheritance theorists, in contrast, again, argue that humans evolved with a cultural twist and that culture changes the character of human evolution in some ways, not entirely, uh, but in some ways, they argue that culture and genes are both adaptive and can also be maladaptive. And lastly, they argue that selection acts on both groups and individuals. Uh, thank you for listening.